more second. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today's guest is one of our very favorites, none other than Dr. Doug Lyle. He's here to do a Q&A based on the questions that you sent in. We will try to answer the live questions, but we always give preferential treatment to those who took the time to write the questions in advance. Please welcome all the way from the Aloha State, Dr. Doug Lyle. It's always great to see you, Dr. Lyle. Hey, AJ. Great to see you, too. Oh, I can't wait. So let's get started with the very, very first question. And this one is from Nick. And he says, I'm not, he writes, he goes, I, I asked this question in earnest. I'm not trying to be funny. I don't know where else to look up the answer. And I thought Dr. Lyle would know. Dear Dr. Lyle, every time I do laundry, there's always a sock missing. Where does it go? Well, it turns out that uh, some people are real friendly. And as a result of that, little elves come and live around your property and you don't know it. And they, they need those socks. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what they do with those socks, but they do need them and they will get them out of your dryer. So that's how you wanted to know. And that's what it is. But that happens to me too. And you know, even when I've moved, like I've lived in the same apartment for like 30 years. And even when I moved, they didn't turn up, you know? There was a, there was a really neat mad magazine, uh, uh, you know, uh, cartoon once. Yeah, I, I must have read it 50 years ago when I was a kid. And it was about this guy. He, he was complaining that he always miss, he's always losing stuff. So he only has one of everything. And then he said, then he ran into a, a friend of his that had the same problem. So he said, so I went over there and we're going to put our stuff together, you know, and, and, and the guy said, well, what happened? And he says, well, on the way over, I lost the bundle. <laughs> That's funny. So there you go. That is funny. Okay. On to the next question. This is from Anne. Dear Dr. Lyle, with the family on lockdown, we've been getting on each other's nerves, yelling, swearing, and name calling. This is not our normal way of how we speak to each other. After my third day of anger building up, I ate a chocolate candy bar. I went for a three hour walk, not an exaggeration, and still bought and ate the chocolate bar. I didn't spiral out of control this time, but this is my worry. I don't want to give into the chocolate or other foods I have used for comfort. Please make a recommendation for anger control. Well, there is no recommendation for anger control. Anger comes about uh, as a result of this very specific set of circumstances. Uh, and those circumstances are the perception or the evaluation actually that, that we are being treated unfairly. Okay. So, Anger does not spontaneously arise out of the system as a result of being in too close quarters uh, or anything under, under the kind. Uh, it is a highly specific uh, uh, emotional response that acts as a signal to other people to signal to them that you believe that they are treating you unfairly, okay? So there is no, quote, anger management uh, process or control mechanism, uh, all, all such attempts for the criminal justice system have failed. <laughs> the, uh, so, so really the issue is, uh, you, you know, what specifically is it in a relationship with a specific other individual uh, where you believe you're being treated unfairly? And then we have to get that clear and negotiate it. Okay, so, uh, and so the, the keys to uh, renegotiating things that feel unfair, uh, some very important keys are to, um, to, to make sure that any attempted negotiations that we both understand that they're temporary. So in other words, they are experiments and how it is that we're gonna do things differently. So if you're on your other's nerves, I don't know how that would be or why, but it would be then, hey, listen, I, uh, what I'd really prefer is that, you know, there's no TV between, I don't know, four and eight o'clock, because that's just, I, I finally had enough. Uh, whatever, whatever the specific issue is. And the, the notion should be, hey, let's experiment with that for a week. Let's make a deal so that we can, uh, so that we can uh, see whether or not that works better. That's how it is that we do things. So we, uh, the anger is not coming out of nowhere. It's coming out of a highly specific inference that someone else is being insensitive or aggressive and that they are treating us unfairly. We address whatever that is uh, as clearly and, you know, as clearly and reasonably as possible. And we say, listen, I'm irritated. And let me tell you why I'm irritated. 
it seems to me that this is how it would be fair and this is what's going on. And so let's hear what it is that they have to say about it because they may be retaliating against some other grievance that they have against you, at which point it's like, okay, that's fine. Let's, let's talk about all of it. And then let's talk about how we can negotiate whatever the conflicts are. Remember, uh, at the source of, of uh, human struggles, whether they are wars between nations, political parties, <clears throat> or, uh, or between two people, uh, what you have is conflicts of interest. Okay, uh, conflicts of interests are inherent in life. In other words, uh, it, it's like, huh, it just doesn't seem like it. Can't we all just get along? And the answer is, well, tell that to the lions and the gazelles that are on the African savanna. They have the ultimate conflict of interest. Okay, so people have conflicts of interest. You know, uh, two two people love each other and they're riding in the car. One of them wants it three degrees warmer. The other one doesn't. We've got a conflict of interest, okay? If that happens consistently, we have to plan for it. Somebody needs to wear a sweater or have a blanket in the car so that both can be as comfortable as is reasonable. So yeah, your the, the anger isn't something that visits us from on high. Uh, this was actually a Freudian notion, uh, which turns out to be wrong, like most Freudian notions. It's the notion that anger built up in what's known as a homeostatic drive. So homeostatic drive is a tension system that builds up like the hunger drive does. So does thirst, so does sleep. The longer you go without sleep, the more demanding your nervous system is that you sleep, okay? The, uh, that's a homeostatic drive, it naturally builds up. Freud believed that that was true um, of people's anger, okay? He was mistaken. Anger is not part of homeostatic drive, neither is laughter, okay? so. If you haven't laughed in a while, it isn't because you're building up a laugh chip that if a comedian says something dumb, you're going to laugh at it because you haven't laughed in two weeks. No. And the truth is, is that if they're really funny, if it's Rodney Dangerfield and they tell 400 jokes in an hour and 200 of them are good, you're going to be laughing every minute of that performance. Uh, it never runs out. Okay. So same thing is true with your anger. You, you, could, you could go in principle a month without feeling an impulse of anger if nobody did anything that was unreasonable. Now, if you're me, you've got enough disagreeable in you, I'm getting a little anger every day. <laughs> okay, it's, uh, there's, there's, it doesn't, doesn't take much uh, for me to have a little irritation and, and, a, and, a, uh, and hey, I, I'm a pussycat compared to Alan. You ought to tour around with Alan for a couple of hours. He, he, it's not like he's in a rage, but he's got this irritation because he's, He's irritated at an employee in a restaurant that doesn't seem to be hustling enough for him. Not that he feels like he deserves better service. He's actually feeling like the employer deserves a better employee. It's a very interesting uh, to get a, to, to take a walk through Alan's mind and ask him what's going on all the time. So, uh, but that's not a dry, this, it's not a buildup. He walked in the restaurant, not angry at all. Uh, and 15 minutes later, he's irritated. Uh, and it's because he believes, uh, in this case, it's not him so much that's being treated unfairly, but somebody else. AJ is that way. So AJ, a lot of times, uh, doesn't, doesn't care about how people are treating her. She cares about how they're treating the animals or somebody else's defense was. <laughs> and then let me tell you, folks, look out, <laughs> batten down the hatches. <laughs> okay, so anger is a natural mechanism that comes about out of the perception of unfairness. So if you're having that process go on in your house with somebody that's in the house, not surprising uh, that that happens, uh, that there's gonna be natural conflicts of interest that will emerge and uh, let's negotiate them. Let's be clear, we're not fighting, we're not, we're not arguing, it may sound like an argument as you make your case, but what we're trying to do is resolve the conflicts so that they're reduced. That's what we do and then there's no excuse for the chocolate then. And we have to come up with some other excuse. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, thank you. This is from Susan. And, you know, you talk a little bit about this in the pleasure trap, and I never quite understood this whole thing about stretch receptors. So maybe yeah. you can expound on it. She says, Dear Dr. Lyle, do we experience satiety via the stomach stretch receptors, or is it affected by sufficient nutrients in the food also? And why does starch help with satiety? Ah, uh, the issue is, is that both of them contribute to a sense of satiety. So it's not one or the other. 
And so in fact, so you can imagine, for example, let's suppose that you sat down and started eating heads of uh, iceberg lettuce, nice dense heads of iceberg lettuce. Sooner or later, uh, by the time you'd eat three large heads of lettuce, your stomach would be, uh, uh, the stretch receptors would be screaming and you wouldn't want to eat another bite. You'd feel um, like you couldn't eat another bite. In fact, you might not be able to eat another bite. You might start regurgitating some of that food uh, up, up in the esophagus and start burning your throat. Okay, so, the, um, so that would be stretch reception, but notice that you wouldn't actually be satiated even though that you could need another bite because your stomach, stomach would be stretched out. So we can see that uh, the feeling of satiety is actually an integrated experience uh, between stretch reception and nutrient reception. So, it, uh, so for example, if you eat a chocolate bar, you can feel you might have been hungry before you ate a chocolate bar. Let's make it two. So we eat two Snickers bars or two Cliff bars or something. You can feel slightly ill, okay? And in fact, not really hungry, even though you can tell that there's been very little stretch reception. That's because you just dose the system with a tremendous amount of concentrated nutrition and there are nutrient receptors in your stomach that can tell that you just ate a hell of a lot of calories, okay? So what the system is designed for is it's designed for intermediate level caloric density. Uh, it, it's actually designed to try to hit it about right. And somewhere about right is, is going to be uh, based on, you know, probably very typically somewhere between three and 700 calories a pound for whatever food stuffs are in your stomach. So that's gonna be typical, uh, say if we picked a number like 500 calories a pound, that would be typical of the, of the food that someone would eat at a given meal in our natural history. And so therefore we would expect that the nutrient receptors and the stretch receptors would basically more or less agree uh, about what time it is to stop. Now, we can look a little further in this and see how this works. Um, so for example, let's suppose we eat very low calorie density foods. So let's suppose that we're eating, um, oh, just steamed vegetables and steamed potatoes. So the steamed potatoes are 375 and the steamed vegetables are 200. So we average, say, call it 300 calories a pound. Now, we can imagine that by the time we've eaten a pound of these, uh, we've got a decent amount of stretch reception, but let's suppose we eat, you know, a pound and a half. Now, normally that pound and a half would have resulted in 750 calories, but today it results in 450 because we're averaging 300. So now you can have a situation where the stretch receptors are telling you, wow, I'm really pretty darn full, but I still feel some hunger drive. And so very often people that eat very low calorie density food, what they'll do is they'll eat more. So they will eat until they're really stuffed. So they may wind up eating two pounds of food. So they eat 600 calories, which is still less, you know, uh, 600 calories of food. That, that would be the equivalent of 1.2 pounds of 500 calorie pound food, but they've eaten two pounds. So uh, now finally they reach satiation, uh, but, but, they, but the satiation is being more, more, uh, more uh, impacted by stretch reception and by nutrient reception. So we don't have the weird feeling of the iceberg lettuce, which feels like we're still hungry and we're gonna to starve to death, even though we've eaten two pounds or three pounds of iceberg lettuce, uh, that we're not having that sensation. We have sufficient detection of nutrients, i.e. calories, that we are not hungry anymore, but it took a long time to get there. It took two pounds of eating to do it, which would be not typical for humans. So you can eat such a diet. Uh, AJ eats a low calorie dense diet. Many people do. Uh, many people uh, are very satisfied eating that way rather than eating greater uh, degrees of concentration. But uh, so the answer to the question, both of these processes, they are, they are different types of neurons. And so those neurons integrate in a way to give an overall picture. The same thing is true, for example, of your eyesight. So your eyesight is going to use both rods and cones. It's going to use both black and white reception. Uh, that's going to be incidentally by far the most sensitive. Uh, so you can, you can see a tiny photon 
you know, just the smallest amount of light energy against a, a black field. Um, but if we put it in color, you wouldn't be able to see it. So the, the, the uh, rods are extremely sensitive to light. That's a very basic part of the nervous system. The cones, uh, which are the ability for us to see color, that's a later innovation uh, in primate color vision. And so that's, uh, they're not as sensitive to light uh, specifically. So, but your, your experience is actually the experience of both of those types of neurons integrated together when you open your eyes. So both, uh, you, you don't realize that it's actually being done piecemeal by two different kinds of neurons, but it is. And the same thing is true of your, uh, your satiety mechanisms. They also are, are an integrated experience of two different types of reception. In fact, it's just as with the rods and cones, their cones themselves have different ways that they come up with different colors, the same way that you also appear to have nutrient reception of different macronutrients. So the same thing that causes a fat receptor to go off in your stomach is different than what causes a carbohydrate receptor. So, uh, so in other words, it's, a, it's actually quite a complex process to cause the creature to reach satiety at a reasonably appropriate time. So that's how that works. Who discovered the stretch receptors and nutrient receptors? Can you see them with a microscope? Um, I actually don't know. That's a good question. I know that they, they were discovered. Uh, I can remember one researcher uh, all the way, possibly back to the 1960s, a, um, a, a, a guy by the name of J. Anthony Deutsch. Uh, so there, there's a phys these were discovered uh, predominantly by uh, psychologists, uh, a specific kind of psychologist called a physiological psychologist. And so today the, the field of physiological psychology and neuroscience are effectively, well, psychology in principle is nothing other than a, than a subset of a, a, broader, uh, a broader set of problems that we call neuroscience. So a physiological psychologist at this, at this point might as well be called a neuroscientist. Uh, and so they're studying the way the nerves work with respect to different kinds of stimuli. Yeah, but those are the individuals, and that was the science that was done. It was done in animal experiments. Uh, this is how they did it. So they, they put little balloons inside of animal stomachs, and then they would blow them up, and they would see what, what would happen to their feeding behavior. They did all kinds of things to try to figure out uh, what must be in there and how it is that they worked. And then since that time, they've, they've become increasingly sophisticated. I wonder what happens to people that have gastric bypass because they, they're cutting out their stomach, so they're losing some of this perception, right? They are. And so it makes it so that what happens is, is that if you can imagine, it's kind of like a, um, uh, if, if, you, if you make it much, much smaller, then of course, part of the nervous system is still seeking satiety at say, for example, um, you know, a pound of food and 600 calories. But if you've cut the stomach down to the where it's very, very small, then you can't put a pound of food in there. And so when you put a half a pound of food in there, you are stretching that thing very, very hard. And so it screams to the nervous system that we're full. So it's a bizarre experience because there hasn't been that much nutrient reception and there isn't an all, it's kind of like having, you know, like a, a 50% of your vision blocked. Uh, in other words, now you, you can only see parts of the picture. And, um, and so it, it, it basically, what will happen is essentially what's happened is, is as if the person has experienced a gunshot. It, it, it's as if somebody shot off, shot away half your stomach or 70% of your stomach. Uh, and so essentially there's been a catastrophic injury to the system. And the, 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 the genes are smart enough to know that's true. So they are not fooled for very long by this tiny, tragic little stomach that the person has and that they're, that they're filling it. Uh, they're going to they're gonna wind up wanting to fill it with very rich food so that they can get enough food, so they get enough food in there to survive. That's what's going to happen. Now, for a while, the system will not adapt to that uh, for a while. So what happens is the small amounts of food will cause satiety to happen. And these people can eat a lot less for a long period of time and they'll lose a hundred pounds. Uh, check them out five years later. Five years later, the nervous system 
has had time to repair the damage of this catastrophic injury. And now it's attempting as best it can to signal honestly to what the person it thinks it needs. And so if they are re-eating those rich foods again, uh, because the, they were always the rich foods they were eating because they never changed their diet because they never addressed the underlying problem, which is the over richness of the food. So they tried desperately to do something which is a, to cause a catastrophic injury uh, to, to the digestive system. The digestive system ingeniously will often worm its way around the injury. And five years later, you see the person, they look just like they did the day they went into the bypass surgery. So that's, so it works for a while while the system is essentially healing and the system may take a long time to heal a catastrophic injury of that nature. Uh, but usually, you know, I, I have, it's been, uh, uh, it's, it's been a, it's, it's, it's been a odd experience for me to be in sitting in the chair that I do to watch people come in who have had a, a surgery and they are elated. It's five months later and they're down 80 pounds and the, um, everything's working fine and they take their supplements because they have to have that because they don't have adequate nutrition otherwise. And I'm thinking, I don't think this is going to work. I mean, it looks like a winning hand. It looks like a winning poker hand, but I think you're going to get crushed by, by the realities of your ability to recuperate that, that you don't know. And sure enough, I've seen these people three years later, they, they may be, maybe they lost 50 pounds out of the 200 that they had to lose. In other words, they, they lost 150 and they gained 100 back. And, and it's, it's like watching the tide come in. You know, so yeah, anyway, that's the, that's the story is that a lot of damage is done. The system is then forced to deal with trying to get the data out of a very tiny data set of, of what cells are left to them. And, um, and ingeniously, the system will ultimately heal and the person will wind up in the same boat that they started with. Only now they have a, a catastrophically limited digestive system, which is so, you know, never cut out an organ or anything else on your body that you might be able to use. This is precious material that, that cannot be, you know, cannot be mimicked by all the ingenuity of human science. So um, I'm, I'm impressed by some things that we can do. You know, you can put a pacemaker in uh, and really save somebody in a cardio, cardiovascular uh, crisis. I mean, we can do some things that are spectacular. Someday they'll have artificial hearts you know, I mean, that we'll be able to work pretty well. Uh, but hey, listen, there's nothing like the original equipment. And uh, so uh, if we're having problems, it's usually because we're not treating the equipment properly. Are you familiar with uh, Josh Lajani, Dr. Lyle? What's that? Are you familiar with uh, Josh Lajani? He's yeah. a plant-based uh, motivational speaker and runner, and he used to weigh over 400 pounds, and he was considering gastric bypass. And then he learned about calorie density, and he said instead he decided to make the food larger instead of making his stomach smaller. Oh, beautifully said. Yeah, beautiful. and he and he's, he's he's kept the weight off, and he's a real he, a real inspiration. And he's uh, amazing. That's so, uh, someone, a uh, Joe watching live said she Googled it, and it said Stephen Liberley's at Harvard Medical School discovered two types of stretch receptors. So thank ah, you. Uh, when 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 or when that was? Uh, okay. Joe Joe Google it again so I can tell Dr. Lyle, yeah. and I'll I'll answer it after I'll tell him after I ask the next question from Kyle, and it's dear Dr. Lyle, can you please explain what the placebo effect is and is it real? I read the book you recommended. Anatomy of an Epidemic, and it talked about how in clinical trials, placebos were as effective as Prozac. If that's true, why not just give patients placebos? Yeah, um, that gets a little, that gets a little complicated. Um, the reason why uh, the, the placebo, none of them are effective. So what they, uh, the, the effect that they would see in the antidepressant trials had to do with a specific question on the depression inventories. So they ask you a lot of things. So they'll ask you about suicidal ideation. They'll ask you about how hopeless you feel. They'll ask you about a bunch of stuff. And once again, what they're gonna do is they're gonna integrate your score from these questions into a single index. Uh, so on the Beck depression inventory, they might, your score might need to be 18 or whatever it is on the, on the score sheet. The, um, the, the one thing that that both the, the Prozac and the placebo impact is uh, one on energy. 
So it's, of course, considered that it's one of the so-called vegetative signs of depression, uh, as if depression is some kind of bizarre mythical state when all it really is it's a signaling mechanism to tell you that you're having failure feedback from uh, biological challenges. That's what depression is, okay? But they don't see it that way. They see it as a, they've conveniently, um, conveniently reconceptualized it as a chemical imbalance of your brain and a mysterious disease process that visits you, okay? Some, something like anger, okay? So, the, um, so what happens uh, in clinical trials is that the SSRIs have an agitating characteristic to them, uh, an amphetamine-like characteristic. So what happens is, is that if you start to take them and we, we test your score on a depression inventory a couple of weeks later, we're going to find that the question that says, I feel uh, no, like I don't have any energy. Oh no, suddenly you have energy. And so your overall depression score is dropping because that specific question is looking better. So that was a, that was an advantage. That's a way that they put their, their, uh, they put their thumb on the scale of the depression inventories so they can say, oh, look, you know, our, 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 our Prozac is working because we can see the depression scores have dropped. Well, then some people got smart uh, that were wanting to know the truth. And they said, wait a second. Uh, it's all about the energy question. So we need to have a placebo that's what's known as an active placebo. An active placebo is slightly agitating. It's not meant to deal with any depressant symptoms at all. It's just a, maybe a little bit caffeinated. I don't know how they do it. But anyway, when they use an active placebo, that's not meant and has no fancy theoretical chemistry to, to rebalance your brain along depressive processes, that active placebo will have the same impact as the antidepressant on that score. And therefore the scores look the same. So neither one of them has actually impacted what you and I would call depression. Uh, both of them wind up impacting the depression score as they target the variable that they can get to. So uh, the answer is, is that the placebo effects, placebo effects are uh, essentially zero. They are short term and they are tricky. So they're tricky that if you ask the questions in the right way, and you lead people, it's like a leading question by a prosecutor. So a prosecutor that's really clever can get you to admit all kinds of things, okay? The, uh, and that, that's uh, how the placebo effect will work that people, uh, if, they are, if they are looking for and feeling like something is happening, which is what happens uh, when they start to take uh, many of these psychiatric medications, there's some kind of little side effect that's coming along with it uh, that causes them to know that they are having something happen. And if they've been told that something good is gonna happen and that they're gonna feel it, then they start feeling like, oh, what do you know? That little pill is actually working for me. And that of course, what that can do is that can cause a short-term optimism, uh, whether it's in an active placebo group or not, uh, or within, when it's in, in a treatment group or not. So there can be a short-term optimism, but no long-term positive effect. Okay, so placebo effects are short term, they're very transient, and they're minor. So there is no magic of putting, putting placebo in the water and then having everybody happier. No, the reason why people are depressed uh, is because of natural failure feedback signals, the same reason they're angry, the same reason they're lonely, the same reason they're tired, uh, and the same reason they're happy. Uh, you're, you feel uh, any feeling, whether it's a physical sensation or an emotional experience, you're feeling those because of uh, deep, uh, deeply embedded algorithms in the system are responding to your life circumstances and giving you a thing called a feeling. And that feeling is a very sophisticated creation that is not easily changed. It's, it's changed when circumstances change. Oh, I, you know, I always wanted to ask you this. I hope you don't mind. You can just answer it quickly. It, I had an experience. I have a torn rotator cuff and it's been yeah. hurting a while. And when I went to the doctor, he gave me pain medicine and he, I, I didn't feel it. But just once I got the prescription, it just started to feel better. <laughs> it, yeah. yeah, that that was probably coincidence, interestingly enough. So and of course, you can imagine 
if you were to track the pain in your rotator cuff from day to day, very, very carefully, let's suppose we had done that for three months, we would find there would be uh, vicissitudes of that pain. In other words, that, that would definitely, all days would not be the same. But you, if you then do something like somebody hands you a pill bottle or God forbid you start taking some orange pill, you are going to have day, you're gonna now notice uh, when there's a, a, a reduction of the pain and you're gonna attribute it to the pill rather than the natural background uh, variation. So that's likely what actually occurred there, AJ. Uh, that's super common. Yeah, well, super common. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just happy. I'll yeah, take it. Good. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you. Okay, so Lisa said, uh, Dear Dr. Lyle, you, when you spoke the last time in AJ's group, you mentioned about some of your clients that suffer from binging, you mentioned salt to them as something that they may want to omit. I've never heard this before. Could you please expound on that? I don't suffer from binging, but I don't eat salt. And when I do eat other people's food or at restaurants, I do notice that it does have an effect on my appetite and I eat much more food than I intended. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you're designed by nature to yeah. seek out sodium and you need it. It's essential nutrient. And so you've got, uh, we can tell how important it is uh, because we are extremely sensitive to that on the tongue. There are very specific uh, mechanisms, uh, essentially neurons built into, built into your tongue to be extremely sensitive to sodium. So sodium is critical for your survival and therefore you're designed by nature to like the taste of it uh, in the same way that you like the, the feel which I'm gonna do right now because I'm slightly thirsty because I've been talking. So I just drank probably a third of an ounce of water and that feels good, okay? It's a tiny little relief that goes on there. So you're being pushed and pulled around uh, by automated mechanisms that are telling you when you're doing the right thing and when you're doing the wrong thing. Um, and that's how that works. So sodium is one of those things. So you're designed, uh, sodium is a, not just an essential nutrient, it's also, um, you, you wouldn't have such a, a, um, a system if it wasn't also sort of scarce and difficult and important. So of course, in, in the same way that fat is scarce and difficult to get and super important. So it's no surprise that if you get a concentrated source, you should be extremely motivated to exploit it Okay. And you are. And so as a result, what's going to happen is if you start sprinkling salt on your potatoes, you are going to be highly motivated to keep eating those potatoes uh, because that signal is telling you that you are solving an important potential nutrient deficiency issue. Okay. So that's the problem with salting up food. Salting up food it, uh, it, in unnatural concentrations of the salt, which is basically a salt shaker on anything that's going to give you an unnatural concentration of sodium, that's going to cause you to be more aggressive about eating more of that food. Your brain doesn't know that the salt is on top of the food and it's not part of the food. Your brain just says, hey, the salt in the food. <laughs> okay. So the entire integrated experience, it's just like your, your vision. If we pulled all the reds out of your vision, it wouldn't be as an exciting a world to look at. If you lost your ability to see red, it would be like, wow, you know, something about this landscape seems really bland. I don't see, I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it. If we put the red back in, you're like, wow, now that's a lot richer. That's what's going on. We spice up your experience or we enrich your experience by enhancing, uh, by, by enhancing it. And now you're going to be an awful lot more motivated. So that's what's going on there. And that is a, that's a, a real additional, it, it's not just with overeating, it's also with the maintenance of a binge process. So you, it's very insightful that this uh, questioner noticed that she herself doesn't have a binge eating problem, but noticed essentially, it isn't that you're either a binge eater or not a binge eater, folks. It's not, it's not you know, you're not either agreeable or disagreeable. You're not either, you know, tall or short. You're always on a continuum. And so uh, we can see that bingey behavior is going to take place an awful lot more often. You know, believe me, I binged on vegan pizzas. Why? 
because they were salty. <laughs> if you pulled the salt off those vegan pizzas and it had no more salt in, in it than a bunch of rice and vegetables, I wouldn't have been nearly as motivated to eat that pizza. So that's uh, very, very uh, astute to notice that all of us are going to be reactive to that. And, uh, and of course, much, much more problematically when we have an inherent underlying characteristic to binge. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I, I missed a, a very funny comment from Leslie who's watching live from the earlier question. She says, my socks disappear and resurface as Tupperware lids that don't fit anything. <laughs> Because that's the other thing that I, I I always lose lids too. I don't I don't know where these where do things go. It's crazy. Anyway, we have one more question that's that was <laughs> one more question that was submitted live, and then we can get to I mean that was submitted in advance, and then we can get to any live questions if there's time. This is from Ryan. He says, Dr. Lyle, when the pandemic began, I believe you said it was no more than a bad flu, and things would look better by summer. Have you changed your position? Yeah, I have. Hmm. Yeah, it's certainly a lot worse than many of us thought. And um, I, I uh, certainly believed that, um, that the receding that we saw all over Europe uh, in the summer, so there was two couple months or more in Europe where there's basically no cases. So you saw all these major countries, Spain, France, Italy, uh, and the UK, go through a process where they, they lost uh, whatever it is, six people per 10,000 or right about that level and, um, and uh, essentially less than one in a thousand. And then they were done. And if you go look at the data on World of Media, you're gonna see that there was nothing. Uh, it was essentially, they hadn't done anything different. Some of them on lockdown, some of them hadn't. Uh, the lockdowns uh, appear to be pretty well unrelated uh, in those countries, at least. In other words, if you do draconian lockdowns, uh, then you can, I believe all that those countries are doing is they're essentially uh, it's a, essentially like holding a beach ball under the water. Uh, if anybody's ever done that in a swimming pool, you know that sooner or later that beach ball is coming up. Uh, there's no, there's no stopping it. And so I, I don't think that the lockdown strategy is going to will in the final analysis have proved to be useful. Uh, you see in Sweden, for example, they are, they are, uh, they have not locked down and they have a lower fatality rate per capita than you're gonna see in the UK and Spain and France and Italy and in the United States. So uh, why that's true is an important scientific question, but the most, uh, in other words, we're not sure why they have been so successful, uh, but we, we understand why Germany has been successful because Germany uh, has locked down just with incredible uh, uh, discipline. So we, we understand that Germany uh, has not beat this thing. What they've done is they've held it. They've held it. They're holding the beach ball under the water, okay. And essentially, they're holding it under there. They were counting on a vaccine. Uh, and by God, the geniuses of the medical world looks like they figured it out. So a country, countries like that uh, will will ha will show a winning hand where they they saved you know thirty or forty thousand elderly people from this being their last year. So uh, this. What we're seeing now is interesting. We're seeing a resurgence. Uh, the case ratios that you're seeing are spectacularly high, but that's not, uh, that's not relevant uh, particularly. The only thing that counts, folks, is how many deaths you're seeing. So you, although you see uh, headlines showing record numbers of daily cases in the United States, it's very clear that five or six months ago, there was two to three times as many cases per day than you're seeing now. Okay, so there's no question that that's true. Uh, that there would be no other explanation for why you could lose 2,700 people in a day four months from now, and today you might lose 1,000. Okay, so the, what's happening is, is that uh, the virus is, uh, is, is, is not swept its way through the population as it looked like it had all through Europe. And it, it looked like it was headed that way in the United States. So this fall, uh, I was very hopeful that we were about done with this thing by October and November. Turns out I was mistaken, and many of us were. It looks like it, it, it's finding its way into more nooks and crannies, into areas of the population that have not yet reached, um, uh, I don't even want to say herd immunity, because uh, Sweden, who was suspected and thinking that maybe they had reached herd immunity, are seeing a lot of new cases. But if you look, uh, so the case amount, it looks like it's spectacularly escalating. 
But if you actually look at the fatalities in Sweden right now, it's almost nobody. So they are, they are seeing five or 10 people a day. This is in a country that's a 30th the size of the United States. So it would be the equivalent of us going from the thousand a day we're seeing now down to 100 or 150. In other words, it would be a virtual victory. So uh, the, the answer is, yes, it's worse than, than we thought. Um, it, it, is, it is hitting exactly the same people that we identified early, but it's, it's working its way into the places where it had not yet been. So this is, this is nasty business if you are over, particularly over 70, but particularly over 80. It still remains the case that the majority of people that die of COVID are over 80 years old. Okay, that uh, and the vast majority of people that die of COVID are over 75 with health problems. Okay, so uh, this is with for the rest of us. For for example, people under 60, this is very akin to the flu, in terms of its uh, in terms of its, of its lethality, uh, uh, with one exception being pregnant females. So pregnant females, this is this is nasty business for them. Uh, but for, for everybody else, uh, the, for, you know, 75% of the population, this is actually not any major health threat, uh, that, that we can identify as of yet. We've got pretty good evidence that that's true at this point. Uh, we don't know about the long-term consequences of having had a, a COVID case and whether or not there's going to be complications later in life. Um, we wouldn't necessarily expect that that would be true. What we see is that this is nasty business. You know, if you're over 80, and you catch COVID, there's a, whatever it is, maybe 3% chance you'll die from it, uh, maybe 5%. That's a lot, you know, that's scary. But keep in mind, that's what it is. So if you're 83 and in good health, if you get COVID, your odds of survival are probably 97%. But those percentages of one or two or 3% is enough. We've got enough people in those ages in the United States that that as it works its way through the population and there doesn't seem to be a very effective way to stop that from happening, no matter how much care people have about transmission, it were, you know, this is a tiny, tiny little microscopic entity and it winds up getting everywhere. Uh, it's kind of like radiation, you know, uh, if anybody ever saw Silkwood back in the day, uh, the movie, it's like, by God, you know, you get radiation loose and you can't find it. Uh, it, it can be everywhere. And so that, that appears to be the problem. And so it eventually, even places where you protect it very well, it eventually finds its way there uh, through some person, some individual. And then suddenly we get an outbreak uh, in that area and then we're gonna have some fatalities in our elderly people. So uh, if you're, uh, I, I would be worried if I was post 70 and ill, or I would be worried just generally uh, if I was an aged person, uh, you are going to want to stay away from it. Just keep yourself healthy. Keep yourself rested. Uh, first sign of trouble, make sure we aren't getting exhausted. Uh, but but I, help is on the way. And my uh, a friend of mine, a doctor, a friend of mine is uh, uh, well connected in in in, in England. And uh, she tells me that this they're planning to roll out the vaccine uh, December first. And they're, the very first place it's going is to the nursing homes. Okay, that's, that's the very first place it's going. And then after that, it goes to everybody over 80. And then after that, it goes to every, everybody over 70. So I, I expect that the United States, of course, will follow a very similar style. We're a little more wide open. We don't have a national health service. So we're gonna have everybody and their brother that wants one is gonna be getting a, a vaccine. Uh, but we will absolutely direct tremendous attention to the elderly. And when we do so, I think we're gonna have this thing wrapped up in relatively short order. So that's, that's where I think we're going. And this is one of those deals where the geniuses of microbiology may have created this thing. Uh, and the geniuses, the other geniuses of my, microbiology may have fixed it. And I think that that's, that's probably a good guess as to uh, what happened with this incredibly expensive tragedy. Thank you. So those are all the questions that were sent in, and we'll get into as, get to as many as we can of the live viewers. I'm going to put a link to me on my mailing list. If you guys uh, sign up, you can submit the questions in advance. So this one from the live viewer, her name is Mavis, and she says, if you eat in a way that you can't sustain forever, then any weight you lose will come back, correct? Or if I lose the weight and then have chocolate and alcohol, would that matter? 
Yes, it will matter. You're, you, you're, the first way you put it was correct. <laughs> so what your weight is, is your weight is a, a biological equilibrium. So think of a boat uh, that's sort of resting in a very, very calm lake. And then I want you to think about uh, them coming up and, and putting big old heavy barrels of, of rock on that, big old barrels of rock on the boat. Then the boat's going to sink, right? And then when we move it over to the next island, we take the uh, rocks off of it, it goes back up to where it was before on the water. We can see the little mark in the water. That's equilibrium. So your, your weight, uh, even though it may look like it's changing day to day, which of course it is, your fat content isn't changing day to day. Your, your body composition is in an equilibrium uh, uh, as long as your behavior is in an equilibrium. So if you're eating about the same types of foods and you're exercising about the same way you do, then your body composition is essentially in an equilibrium. You're a boat sitting in a very calm lake and nothing is changing. Now, if we change something, so suddenly we improve the diet dramatically, we get rid of a bunch of rich food. Now we've taken a bunch of stuff off the boat. Now the boat floats at a different level, okay? So let's suppose we lose 30 pounds. So I have somebody that has lost amazing amount of weight, a bunch of it had to have been sodium related, but uh, in about the last six weeks, I've had somebody lose 25 pounds. Uh, that's, you know, 15 of that was probably that she was on a very high sodium diet. Uh, and so therefore we probably dumped 15 pounds of sodium, which was a great, I mean, 15 pounds of water, which was spectacular for her heart. Um, but the other 10 pounds or maybe 15 could have been, uh, were from leaning down. Okay, now, if she goes back and eats just what she was eating before, that 25 pounds is coming back, <laughs> okay, for sure, just as sure as the sun will rise. So that is, that is the correct issue. Uh, that's why I have no interest in people having this attitude of, of essentially like a Doberman. They're just going to go after something uh, like weight loss and try to get there as fast as they can. I'm like, no, or like a greyhound, like, no. Don't be in a rush. Make the changes that you are willing to make forever or that you may be willing to make forever. In other words, it's like, okay, boy, if I could be 30 pounds lighter, you know, I would be willing to do this, that, and the other in order to get there. Good. So do this, that, and the other to get there. See what happens. And let's find out. Let's put six months behind that and let's see what, see what takes place. And uh, if it turns out that you're down 30 pounds in six months, then all you have to do is keep doing what you're doing that brought you there. Uh, you don't get to go then go back now that you've lost the weight. You get to stay, you get to look good and get slowly fatter for a while, but sooner or later, you're going to put it all back. That's uh, if, you, if you go back to your old habits. Your, your weight is stable because your behavior is stable. Your weight is simply a reflection of, your, of an inter interaction between your behavior and your genetics. Okay, The genetics, we can't change. They stay the same. So when your weight is changing, it's changing as a result of your behavior changing. And so that's how that works. I remember you saying and feel fabulous that there's, there's no, really no such thing as a plateau. It's really a behavioral equilibrium. And yes. that we must do whatever we're willing to do forever. So not to eat like on a diet to lose weight and then go back to the way you're eating. That, that's what most people do though. Of course, it's not a waste of time. Yeah, absolutely. It's, 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 it's great for you know Weight Watchers and slim fast, all those people, they just keep people uh, spinning around in a, in a, in a frustration circle. Now we're trying to solve the problem here and give you a deep understanding uh, to do something that is very difficult to do, which is to actually beat the problem at its source. Okay. So like our friend that uh, I'm delighted to hear about this guy that, that, uh, that skipped the bypass surgery and did it right. It's like, what a, what a beautiful outcome. Uh, to hear about. Uh, I, I love to hear about those outcomes. It, it tells us and reaffirms for all of us that, uh, that if, we, if we change, for things to change for us, we have to change. Yep, absolutely. Devin, who's watching live from Australia says, until my experience at True North, I didn't realize my excess weight was a result of addiction. Having taken control over that addiction, am I prone I am prone to other addictive behaviors. How do I stop the cycle? Um, I'm not sure exactly what he's asking. Okay, so in other words, 
your food addiction is normal. That's not something specific to you or your personality. So essentially 100% of all people are as addicted to the modern food supply. So if you have suffered from that problem, that means it is situation normal, okay? It is an exceedingly unusual and rare individual that's diet is not made up of concocted, you know, mediocre food. So uh, that, so now I guess that I'm not sure if the second question is essentially that he's suggesting that he's gonna sub because, in other words, he's starting out by saying, gee, don't I have an addictive personality? I was addicted to food. If we pull the food addiction away, isn't it going to sprout up over here in cigarettes and alcohol? No. Okay. You're, you are, if you were, uh, you're not going to cause one addiction from getting rid of another one. That, that, that isn't how it works. The, um, your, you, you may, in other words, the, if you are, if you are an individual, you, you don't solve, for example, let's suppose we have a, an alcoholic that's eating healthy. Uh, what we don't say is, okay, I'll tell you what you're going to do. Start eating crap so that you can give up the alcohol. So you can get your dopamine that way from eating chocolate bars. That isn't going to work. Okay. So the, um, no, the, the, the problems that we have are essentially independent. So you've got a, if you have a susceptibility to alcohol, you have a susceptibility to alcohol. If you have a susceptibility to cigarettes, you've got a susceptibility to cigarettes. The, uh, if you have a susceptibility to gambling, you have a susceptibility to gambling. Uh, the, the food susceptibility is widespread and natural. Um, and, and so just about everybody is going to be in that trap to, to some degree or another. If you get out of that trap, you are not more susceptible to other addictions at all. Okay, they are, they are independent phenomena. And the bummer is, is that it's not going to necessarily help you with one of those. So you can be, uh, if you've got a problem with, with alcohol, for example, getting your eating clean is, is not any, any, you know, isn't, isn't the magic key to getting sober. Um, it's not going to hurt, uh, but it's not going to be some magical big help that we think it might be. It won't. The big problem is we have to face down all the little angles and issues that come with alcohol. And that's a complicated matrix. Somebody's asking if you're familiar with Dr. Judd Brewer's work on addiction. No. Okay. And then somebody's asking, who is your favorite evolutionary psychologist? Oh, I don't have a favorite. They, uh, there's, there's seven or eight, there's half a dozen that are just beyond brilliant. So uh, John Chibi and Lita Cosmides are the original great uh, geniuses of the field. Um, uh, Jeffrey Miller is one of the most exciting, innovative thinkers in the field. The uh, uh, Steven Pinker is a is a polymathic, a brilliant human being that that uh, who's who's thinking in the blank slate is just literally odd me with uh, a, a mind that that diverse and wide. And um, and David Buss is uh, probably the most prolific, relentless researcher in in the field, uh, and has produced more data in support has filled in more blanks in the field than any other single researcher. So, uh, and there are, there are other great minds, but those are, those are the ones that leap out to me. And, and I can't forget people that aren't psychologists. All of those people are formally PhDs and professors in psychology. There are others who were extraordinarily important in the field, uh, Richard Dawkins, Edward O. Wilson, uh, and uh, William Hamilton. Uh, these, are, these are deep theoretical biologists and their work laid the foundation for the birth of evolutionary psychology. Robert Trivers as well. Well, you're our favorite and people are saying, I love Doug, just so you know. <laughs> you're, um, Eve says, I am going sugar-free for the umpteenth time. I am four days into this and I'm finding that I'm getting extremely tired. I don't remember experiencing this on previous attempts to kick sugar. Do you have any theories about why I'm getting exhausted? Nope. nope. Okay. It's late. All right. Probably up, you're probably up and skipping some sleep thinking about the sugar. Who knows? Oh. But uh, oh. no, it, it's not. Uh, it, it's not a res result of any kind of sugar withdrawal process. Uh, you, you are all you have to do is make sure you're getting adequate calories, and you probably are. And if you're not, you will because the hunger drive will tell you. 
Okay. I don't know if this question is, is one you can answer. Cause I, I try to explain to people, you're not a medical doctor, although you definitely know a lot that uh, Jill says, do you have any remedies for menopausal depression, menopausal depression? Um, uh, not really. I think that there, there can be some pretty uh, profound mood shifts that are, that are entirely, um, uh, let me, let me explain what it is that I'm going to try to say. There are uh, those, those kinds of changes can be, can have things go along with them, like mood volatility and frustration tolerance, that those things can, uh, those aren't part of natural design. Those are just consequences of what's going on with the natural design of the organism. So that's a, uh, sorry, that's a pain in the neck. And so you can try to ease that by, uh, by uh, eating foods that are high in natural estrogens. And, uh, and that, that can sometimes soothe over some of those processes. Other than that, uh, uh, sleep, exercise, eat healthily, and, uh, and, and be willing to uh, get a little distance from people close to you when you're, when you're particularly irritable that just at least for an hour. Nancy says, do you have any idea how to get rid of ringing in the ears? Didn't you once say water fasting helped someone that you knew? It did. And so that is a, uh, if you have a, a really irritating uh, tinnitus that, that I would consider that if you can afford it and it's reasonable for you and you're willing to face it, uh, I would, I would consider the possibility of doing a, you know, relatively short, you know, relatively short. I mean, something like what might look like five to seven day water fast. I do it under supervision um, and just see what happens. So if, if it's sufficiently frustrating for you, you might want to give that a try. Uh, we've seen that be successful more than once. Great. No, no idea why. Cool. Uh, Louise says, Dr. Lyle, let, Last you were, you, you were, okay, and this is, you were, I don't understand the way you're writing this, but I, she's saying, I guess you defined a narcissist as a very disagreeable person. Yeah. How do you define a bipolar person from an evolutionary psychology perspective? Yeah, um, what, what you're looking at there is um, uh, suites of genes uh, what, what, uh, so let me sort of describe personality and then we'll qu quickly move to bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, what's, what, are, what are known as, uh, uh, so, so let, me, let me sort of cleave, let me tell you about the history of psychology super briefly. So in the history of psychology, we sort of thought of there being two types of psychological problems. One type of psychological problems uh, we call personality problems and another type of problems we would call like major mental illness. So we sort of thought that something as wacky uh, as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder was some kind of bizarre brain dysfunction, maybe a disease, uh, genetic defect, something of that nature. And we thought of personality problems as, uh, you know, like dependent personality or antisocial personality or or borderline personality, we thought of those as um, things that could have happened in the normal course of personality development that, that were difficult and traumatic. And then this was a psychodynamic response to those things. So <clears throat> if you grew up in a nice, loving, supportive home, uh, then you were unlikely to have any of those problems because you developed normal moral structure. So you're not going to be an antisocial and you developed normal good boundaries with your mother because she didn't you know, want you to sleep with her in her bed till you were 14. And so you developed nice boundaries. And so therefore you didn't, you didn't, you weren't a dependent or a borderline, et cetera, et cetera. So that was sort of the notion. Well, it turns out all of that thinking is wrong. Amazingly enough, you, you could just, you could just take a match to the underlying thinking of the DSM. So the way to properly think of this is that all of these things that you're witnessing are genetic in origin. And the, the, something like a bipolar disorder or a schizophrenia is not a specific genetic defect because it's not one gene or two genes or three little genes where something went wrong. It's an entire host of genes by the thousands. And the way your mind is put together is it's put together by 
it, it's, it's the most complicated soup that you can imagine. Imagine the ingredients of a soup where there are 10,000 different ingredients, okay? Think about that. It's like, okay, in order to make that soup, a very specific pea soup, you literally have to get exactly this combination of flavor. It takes 10,000 different ingredients to do it. Now you can imagine that if you take out one of those ingredients, it's not gonna make much difference. And if you take out seven of those ingredients, it's not going to make much difference. And in fact, if you took out 200 of those ingredients, it's not going to make much difference. If you change 200 of those ingredients uh, to something very, very similar, it's going to be extremely similar soup. Okay, now, so that is what the brain is. It's soup made out of 10,000 different ingredients. It's going to turn out that uh, so people that are both schizof either schizophrenic or bipolar, they have a lot of, of genes that are, they have probably 2,000 of genes that you don't have, that their genes are, uh, what they use, the way genes work is they use very, very similar proteins to do, uh, to do a task. So the reason why um, somebody has, oh, I don't know, uh, Oh God, I don't know. Uh, let me let me think of something. The that the, they grow their nails longer than you or quicker than you is because their genes are slightly different than your genes. As a result of that, or a great example is earwax. Uh, some people have dry earwax. Some people have wet. That's a genetic difference between people. Both of them work. Okay. So when you start looking at uh, what causes a person to be bipolar. It isn't one gene and two genes and three genes. It's a whole host of thousands of genes, and they have just enough of them that they're we're gonna what they're gonna have some characteristics to their personality that are gonna make them very open in some ways and very unstable. So uh, and and so as a result, at times when they are very unstable, their thinking can be wild. It can be damn. It can be psychotic. It can be not in touch with reality. Usually that's not true. Usually they're just very open and very excited, extremely optimistic and very energized and unstable emotionally. Okay, now you might say, well, okay, so, you know, so can you be like right on the line and be almost bipolar and then one more gene happens and it tips you over and then you've got this disease? No, you're just on a bell curve, okay? So, you know, at what point, you know, there, there's some point where you say that a man is six feet tall, but is he tall and somebody else short who's 5'11 and 15 sixteenths? The answer is no. The guy that's 5'11 and 15 sixteenths is essentially as tall as the guy that's six foot. There's a sixteenth of an inch difference between those two people. You'd look at them, you couldn't even tell who, which was the taller and which was the shorter. So if you get to be sufficiently unstable, uh, you will go through occasional periods, rare in life for people that we diagnose as bipolar, well, you will go through a period of, of instability uh, and, and usually some florid, you know, uh, uh, sometimes in a, in a major episode, downright wacky thinking, it, it's usually short term. So that, that process might last for two or three weeks uh, and in many, many cases, if they were never medicated, you would never see that again. And it turns out that when you start medicating that, damage gets done to the system and then makes that more problematic in the future, apparently. So this is the, the, the story of anatomy of an epidemic, that if anybody has anybody close to them that suffers uh, from, quote, a major me mental illness, which would be uh, bi bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, the uh, understand that you know, this isn't a disease. This is a, uh, this is of the 10,000 ingredients. They got enough of those ingredients that they're, that they're over here sharing characteristics with people that we might diagnose with that. In other words, uh, if, if it would require a thing to, to, it's six foot five, we start calling somebody a giant. And so the person you're thinking of might be six, four and a half, okay? And somebody's calling them giant. Uh, or they might be six, five and a half and, and they're being called giant, but that's what it means to carry one of those diagnoses. So this is why the history of diagnosis in psychology and psychiatry has been a real fiasco uh, because it, I, I, I have to tell you, I've been there. I was a, a certified by the National Institute of Health to help 
with a major clinical trial at the University of Texas. And I had to go undergo training in order to make me a quote, reliable diagnostician, okay? And it turns out it's unreliable as hell, <laughs> okay? So you have six experts in a room and they're quietly voting on, is that a schizoid or is that a schizophreniform disorder or is that a schizophrenia or is that a brief reactive psychosis? Or is that, it's like, oh, for crying out loud, you got six different doctors, all experts, six different diagnoses. Okay, so that tells you that the whole concept of categories is out the window. And it turns out that what, we, what is really is, is gene, individual gene differences. And if you have enough height genes, we call you tall, but what does that really mean? It just means that you're tall relative to the population. If we call you schizophrenic, it means that you are that you are bizarrely open in your thinking. You will entertain, uh, believe me, there's a lot of people in Hollywood, including AJ, <laughs> that have a lot of open thinking, okay? And they, they think a lot of sort of wildly creative, implausible things. They're not crazy, okay? But guess what? They might have a third cousin that's got a diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> because that third cousin got just 400 more of those kind of open wacky genes. And it turns out that they go through periods where they're not, not right. In other words, they're thinking things that are completely wrong. I have dealt with many people with major mental illness, literally hundreds of them in my career. Uh, many of them unmedicated, many of them very functional. And yet they've got some odd thinking in their head and they meet criteria for diagnosis of major mental illness. They have some functional problems because some of the wacky ideas that they think, but they can be very effective. I've met, met uh, professional people uh, with, with graduate degrees that carry these diagnoses and are carrying around some strange thinking in their head and you'd never know it. <laughs> so uh, I hope that's a uh, useful explanation. That was great, people. Oh, oh, by the way, if you wanted to get a closer look at this explanation and to understand more fully what it is that I'm trying to explain. Uh, you can read the, the masterwork blueprint uh, by Robert Plowman. Uh, Robert Plowman is the Pope of personality. He's the, he is the, the, the deepest and, and, and wisest uh, researcher and thinker that we have now having written his opus in his seventies. Uh, the book is blueprint and it will tell the story of exactly that question. Yeah, and I got I got it on Audible. I'm listening to it. It's, very, it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's not easy, uh, but it's it, but it's rich. All right. Well, uh, people are just thanking you, saying you're an amazing teacher. Lots of questions now on ADHD and whether we should they should take Prozac. But I, hopefully, you'll come back next month and answer some of these questions. Anatomy of an epidemic. Read that first before right. you ever give anything like that to a child. Great. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Lyle. Okay. All right. Thanks, AJ. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. As you know, we're late all week, meaning we're doing the broadcast not at the usual 11 a.m. Pacific time because of the GI Health Summit, which runs through November 22nd. But our guest tomorrow at 2 p.m. Pacific time is Dr. Von Steele, and he will be giving a lecture on diabetes. Take care, everyone, and aloha, Dr. Lyle.